What's the big deal? I was right in the middle of my Charlie Chaplin XCX mashup movie marathon. Yeah, and I was, um, and then I was doing something just as normal. <laughs> I want to go home. I hate it here. <sighs> we have a problem. There's a rat on the ship. We need to humanely catch and set it free outside to live out the rest of its life. Yes, until it drowns in the abyss of the sea. Ew, a rat? How did it even get on board? This is a sealed vessel. It's possible it's a quantum rat, superpositional bastard. Um, those don't exist. That's their trick. They're real and not real at the same time. Wildlife conservation isn't as straightforward as you might think. While we hunt for this rat, we want to ask, is hunting actually supporting conservation? Does raising animals in captivity assist in reintroduction efforts? And then, we'll look at conservation wins in the last 10 years. Cool, cool. Um, but what's the plan to actually catch the rat? I don't know. I haven't thought that far ahead yet. Gross. No animals in my kitchen. It is unsanitary. Uh, Dunk, what about you? <gasps> you can't say that. Guys, he's a bear. And you're a twink, what of it? Keep quiet and low. If the rat catches our scent, we'll have to break out the rat bat. Lauren, my great-grandfather was a frontline soldier in the Australian Emu War. I think I know what I'm doing. Okay, Herb, but don't let your guard down. Lauren thinks I'm too prim and proper to hunt, but I know lots about hunting. Did you know that millions of dollars garnered by hunting licenses, land stamps, and taxes on firearms and ammunition go to support wildlife conservation efforts across the world? The money goes to projects like habitat maintenance, rehabilitation programs, surveys, and tons of other conservation efforts. Legal hunting can also help prey by reducing overpopulation, which can lead to famine. Overpopulated prey animals can also begin to impact agriculture as they seek more land for grazing. It can also lead to disease, which can spread to humans. When animals starve, their immune systems weaken and illness can quickly spread through their numbers. The more animals with illness, the more opportunities for those illnesses to make the leap to other species. You know, like us. Ideally, federal, state, and local governments update restrictions to reflect threatened and protected animals, ensuring that only species that could damage ecosystems are on the chopping block. Did you find that rat bastard? No, it's slipperier than an oiled up hog. All right, let me know when you find it. The little guy got into my pantry, and I'm pretty sure he ate a bunch of creatine in pre-workout, so you should consider that gym rat armed and dangerous. Copy that. Another method of managing prey populations is the introduction, and in many cases, the reintroduction of predators, like wolves. But these decisions are controversial. Farmers, and people living in rural areas in particular, have emotional responses to the idea of releasing large predators in their area. How would you feel if your local government was releasing cougars in your neighborhood? And not just the ones that hang out at the bars. Even if data shows that the ecosystem will benefit from it, that naturally means that those predators will make the area less safe. <gasps> a paper by Bernard Blossy and Dara Hare, entitled Myths, Wishful Thinking, and Accountability in Predator Conservation and Management in the United States, write that reintroducing large predators represents a shift towards a more holistic and participatory ecosystem management paradigm, where different and diverse stakeholders can participate and be equal partners in the decision-making process. One view of the natural world is that it should benefit us. It's a resource for us to exploit, but that's not necessarily true or even good for us. Our view of the natural environment is shifting towards a place where we see ourselves as a part of the environment and not separate from it. And when we're a part of something, we don't put up walls to keep it out. Of course, when it's a rat that big, all you can do is run. What's the hurry, Tim Curry? It's out there. I think I have it trapped in the other room. Worst case, Ontario, we just never go back in there. Keep it captive? That seems unethical. What do you want us to do? Dump it in the ocean? Well, 
something aside from keeping it in a prison. Uh, it's not a prison. It's like a zoo or something. Zoos are good for conservation. Debatable. The majority of zoos exist to make a profit, so decisions about animals under their care are typically made with money in mind. One of the biggest money makers for zoos are baby animals, so zoos will breed animals even when there isn't room for them, leading to overpopulation of their human-made habitats. So they have too many animals, so what? Release them in the wild. Unless the zoo's been actively preparing the animal for release, it's likely the majority of captive animals won't survive on their own. They lack basic survival skills that they would have otherwise learned growing up in the wild. The majority of endangered animals like gorillas, rhinos, elephants, tigers, and polar bears will never be released into the wild at all. Wait, why do people think zoos are good for conservation? Marketing is the short answer. The best way to grow a species population is in situ or in place conservation efforts, which are things like protecting habitats, defending them against poaching, preventing them from being exploited as exotic pets, and, well, zoo animals. Most zoos donate only enough for in situ conservation efforts to advertise that they do. In the World Animal Protection's 2019 report, they found that facilities like SeaWorld and Bush Gardens Conservation Fund said they donated over $17 million since 2003. But when you zoom out and look at their revenue, $17 million only accounts for about 0.16% of their total annual revenue. So, pennies. You know what a penny is? Not all zoos are the same, though. The Association of Zoos and Aquariums have a series of guidelines that accredit certain institutions who have made significant steps towards reintroducing endangered species back to their natural habitats. Accreditation is determined by 16 experts in animal welfare, husbandry, and veterinary medicine, and there are currently over 200 AZA official institutions and facilities across the United States. This doesn't mean that all AZA zoos are perfect, but they're taking steps in the right direction. Like how I took a step in the right direction by donating $100 to ethical farming. Herb, doesn't your father own factory farms? Excuse me? He owns all of the factory farms? <sighs> you understand that's worse, right? Okay, Lauren, I doubt there's actually a rah, 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 zoo industrial complex. Uh. Tell that to Dunk. Did you know he lived in a zoo for a year? Do you mean he, like, worked at a zoo, or...? Focus. If we don't catch this thing, I'll have to report back to HQ, and you don't want to know what the procedure for contamination on the ship is. So, zoos can be more or less ethical whether or not they adhere to recommended guidelines. The grizzly bear is a good example. Before 1800, there were about 50,000 grizzlies across the western United States, but by 1975, there were only around 800 survivors. Now, because of efforts to protect their natural habitats, areas like the Greater Yellowstone, the North Continental Divide, and the Selkirks among a handful of others, grizzly populations have grown to just under 2,000. 2,000 is a lot less than 50,000. They're not out of the woods yet. There's still a lot of work to do. Thankfully, Dunk is doing his pizzly part. Grizzlies now only occupy about 6% of their former range, but taking measures to protect their habitats, educating the public on grizzly safety, and putting limitations on trapping and hunting can continue to grow their population. That's good for sure, but it's not really the win I was looking for. I was expecting for a little bit more, you know what I mean? If it's big wins you want, the bald eagle hit an all-time low of about 400 nesting pairs in 1963. The decline was due to a combination of hunting and the introduction of the pesticide DDT, which thinned their eggs, nearly wiping out every bald eagle in the United States. That's a win? Um, Americans nearly eradicating their own mascot? Canada helped, but yes, basically. They were saved in large part by marine biologist Rachel Carson, who released her book Silent Spring, which shed light on the negative environmental effects of DDT in 1962. In 1967, the eagle was put onto the endangered species list, which provided them protections from hunting and preserved much of their habitats. Then by 1972, the American Environmental Protection Agency banned the use of DDT and their populations began to grow. This, alongside captive breeding, and reintroduction grew bald eagle populations back to the point that they've now been removed from the endangered species list. Of course, we've talked about how zoos and keeping animals in captivity can be detrimental, but when coupled with reintroduction, it could do wonders. Cool, yeah. You know what I wonder? What? I wonder why we stopped walking, but I can still hear footsteps. Put your back in it and it won't hold! I can't. I have an itch on my bare side, and I just... Gotta... <laughs> what are you two doing out there? Whew, I should ask you the same thing. You're trying to get rid of me, eh? You're trying to feed me to the rats, huh? Well, you failed, hog boy. You, fa <laughs> you think I mess around? 
You think I'm a fool? It'll be a cold day in hell when big fucking Jay goes down like a chump. I will outlive you. I will outlive God. <laughs> I was so scared. I thought I was going to eat me. I just, oh, oh, little Jay, it's okay. I'll keep you safe. Oh, I wish anyone else was saying that to me. Okay. I think it's time we face this together. As a crew. Love the new kicks, gal. Circles really make your binary pop. Wow, cool. Um, I didn't even know the QA Model 3 could undock from its station, so uh, good, good to know. Cool. You use tech without fully grasping its power? Yeah, uh, how about you go um, eat a big fat block of cheese? That's not a good insult. Wait, one second. Um, no, take your time. You got this. So there's no rat, and we just ran around the ship for no reason? Cool. Yeah, I love that. Not no reason. It's good cardio. I talked about how we are as much a part of nature as it is a part of us. Only by continuing to update regulations based on the needs of our environment can we move forward. And I talked about how zoos that need to generate revenue typically don't put in the real effort or cash to support in-situ conservation efforts. Institutions like the AZA provide useful benchmarks for an ethical zoo. And you and I discussed a couple big conservation wins in the last 50 years. How one woman's book about banning DDT basically saved America's flagship bird. Fine, I guess learning is as good a reward as catching a mutant rat. <laughs> Guys, imagine if there was really a mutant animal on board. That would be crazy. Yeah. <laughs> crazy. 